Making life worth living in retirement worth having is really about the people in our lives. I say this every single day. We're in the beginning mode of a presidential campaign. And most of the time, people like me don't pay too much attention because we often feel our vote doesn't matter. We literally think that no matter what we think of what's going on, we realize that the marketing vacuum of political rhetoric will really consume the real truths of a politician's goals and plans once they're in office. We've seen that a lot with the current presidency, that a lot of the promises that we were made during the campaign didn't actually totally come to pass. Now, there's several reasons for this that are very logical and very journalistically uh, safe and sincerely. Uh, the truth about what happens is that a person sometimes learns more information and has to change their position, or a person's financial contributor has so much power and clout that they can force a change of mind. And openly, that's a slippery slope. Something I really like about some of the current campaigns I seen, have seen today is that literally there is not only a limit on the campaign funds that an individual can produce, but openly they're keeping it simple. They're putting it down at the price for the common man so that when I get some money together, I can literally put my dollars behind somebody I really want to support. I also am looking for the local campaign offices. I'm not seeing that yet, but maybe it's still early in the game for them to be produced. What I feel is that in Indianapolis, we need a change. We need a lot of changes. I think we need a lot of changes in how people understand the human life around them. What I've experienced during my homeless time is sort of unusual. Never in my life did I expect to appear, experience any homelessness. I was practically productive and performing well when I had a home in the arts and design district of an affluent community. I literally was there roughly 10 years. I loved my home. My landlord always gave me a deal in the rent, even though he really wanted higher rents. The problem was that the local populace started putting in really expensive homes. That, of course, increased the value of the properties as much as increased the tax base for people. That was good and bad. The good part about it was that it brought in more productivity in terms of places to go, places to eat, things to do, things in the walking district lots of events, things that we loved as a family to walk over to just a few blocks away. I felt really honored and privileged to live in that district. I loved it a great deal. I loved my home. It was set up exactly how I and my family needed it, and that's why we chose it. It was a little higher than I'd ever paid in my life, but it was totally worth every penny. That landlord and I parted ways. I can't say how we parted ways exactly. I would like to think that after 10 years, roughly, of investment, that he would regard me with honor, dignity, and respect because I made it so that he didn't have to produce a marketing plan every few months of getting a tenant. We had other neighbors that literally were destroying the property. They were noisy, they were loud, they were ruining carpets. They weren't paying attention because their ethics about how they protect a house wasn't the same. We often had late night dog walking with one of the presidents of an automotive school and her name I won't release right now. She's one of my dearest friends as an adult man. I care for her and her husband very much and love their dogs and was sad when one of my favorite dogs passed away and I learned of that through a phone call. When I call now, it's hard to get through, but that's not my point. The point is that the people right next door to us are really important to us. The people in our lives who think they know what they're doing to our lives aren't always the ones we want in our lives. There are people who voyeur, who listen in and do all sorts of things, which is really sort of illicit and immoral. There are other people who create illegal acts against a human being's life. This is a violation of several principles that we hold dear and near to most of our hearts. The first one I talk about all the time, which is the International Declaration of Human Rights. If you're not familiar with that organizational uh, outcome of that meeting of 400 some nations, I would highly, from the United Nations, I would highly encourage you to read it and read all the articles so that you understand what's important, not only in this land, but in lands a world away. The next piece of information we need to think about is civil rights. Civil rights was a movement to allow every human being, but particularly black Americans, to have the freedom of movement and not to be hazed and harassed and mobbed and stalked by local law enforcement who were somewhat affiliated with religious rights and KKK and other hate organizations at the time and the day and openly religious pastors who just weren't getting that Jesus has been proved anthropologically to have been black or mulatto or a dark-skinned person from the Middle East. You see, I can't keep all the facts in my life straight when it comes to history lessons, 
but openly I can tell you what I've learned by listening to valuable resources, quality education on television like PBS. One of my favorite channels for my entire life began with Sesame Street and is now into other things that I really love, like programs from Britain and other things. My point of saying this is that we all have different ways in which we get information about the world. Those people who are just in a humdrum life are literally going back and forth to work and not really thinking at all about what they're doing or what they're saying and how their life impacts others in the small aspects of the roles, rules, and responsibilities, the three R's of their work, aren't really giving other people's lives a lot of thought, not to mention their own life. You see, the minute we start to interfere with someone else's life in any way, shape, or form, not performing our required duty for the employment which we have, like providing poor service or intentionally ruining a food product or simply being difficult to the point that the person doesn't want to come back, we start to put ourselves in that category of playing God in someone's life. Now, what does it mean to play God? Playing God means you start to steal information. You start to look at a person's life and render a judgment. For those of us in the faith world, we understand that no human being is allowed to judge another. We all do quick evaluations. We know in the marketing world that people assess an individual in about three seconds or less. It's a visual thing. They know something is not quite right, and then they talk it out just to confirm. They figure out, is this person a match to me or, is I, or have I totally read this correctly that they're not a match to my soul? You see, something I talked about in my book, Soul Keepers, is how we are family in one way and not in another. What I mean by that is that we have birth families that we come from. Sometimes they have one child, other times they have many children. Either way, we still have parents who are responsible for the upbringing and the uplifting of our souls to become all that the Lord in heaven has put within our souls to become. You see, it's not just whether it's a matter of upbringing or rearing or training or association that produces a life. What it really is, is the Lord's soul or the soul's code, as I think it was uh, John Hillman wrote in his book, and forgive me if I've gotten the name wrong, but it's been a long time since I read that book. It was a wonderful book that got a lot of popularity at the time, but the soul's code is what the Lord puts in. I've noted a wonderful film from the Latin American uh, um, film director and producer whose name I forget, but she's in my LinkedIn profile. I've reached out to her. She did a wonderful film that showed how God puts a soul into a body that goes through a human life. It's wonderful, that film. It really reminds us of the value of life. Now that brings us to the second or third principle, I guess the third principle in my talk, and the right to life. You see, right to lifers are usually highly religious people. What they use as a principle, according to Wikipedia, is the right for someone to live without being killed. If that's the case, then we have to look at the moralistic aspects of what we do in the every single day of life. We live in a highly technological world. And in that highly technological world, if you lose your job, you lose the abilities most of the time, unless you've got a lot of money sucked away from sucked away from your childhood or from some sort of inheritance to pay your bills. You can lose your rights to your home. You can lose your rights to having a telephone. You can use, you lose your rights to having internet service. All the ways in which we communicate today. The impoverished are struggling to get back on their feet, feet most of the time. The reality is they're struggling because they're not getting the help they need. You see, in order to have a life, you have to have technology that doesn't fail you, that doesn't limit your capabilities, that isn't impeded by someone immorally, illegal, or illicitly, or simply someone who wants to say, you know, we don't want you to be successful anymore, so we're just going to turn all this stuff off. I want you to think for a moment back to the time of Nazism, Stalingrad, and all those moments of time when a Hitler of that era literally told people they weren't worthy. We learned about it as children in Dr. Seuss, Stars Upon Thars. I can't say for 100% fact because I'm not a children's literature expert whether that's what he was trying to teach about at that period of time or whether he was just trying to say, you know, everybody's the same. The truth is not everyone is the same. What I mean by that is that the Lord creates a unique soul's code for each human being. He creates a unique life path 
And in my line of work, what I'm discovering is the Lord knows every play there is. Every single play that a human being is going to try to put on another human being, the Lord knows. What happens is the person who is a person of devout faith and submission to the Lord is provided the information in advance. They are literally gifted some knowledge about something. They are gifted in a way that their soul recognizes when something's not right. The people who are totally out of sync with God's house, the house of the Lord, don't get the same information. They are highly reactive. They are highly, highly complaintive. They are highly a lot of things. But here's the difference. When someone submits completely to God, they're saying, I give my life to you, Lord, to steer through the lessons of your will for my life. Some of them don't make sense based on what I'm longing to have and see in my life, but maybe they're to prepare me for the things that other people are monstrously putting on my life. So I know how to keep my body, my mind, my heart, and my soul intact. Now, I've had a lot of people do things in my life. And when I talk about it, you say, oh, that's too bad, or you laugh, or you joke, or you don't want to believe it. But that's not the point. The point of my story is that you have a story too. And the only way you can ever understand another human being's life story is if you start to say, what if it was me? What if it was me whose technology was interfered with? What if it was me whose computer was, was broken? What if it was me whose property was stolen from multiple places, like a car, a storage unit, a home? What if it was me? How would I feel? Would I rage? Now, the difference between a moral man and an immoral man, in my humble opinion, is that a moral man will find a private space, like his car, a house he's staying in, the library, small room, wherever, to let his rage out, to let that anger and vehement opposition to having his rights illegally on the federal level removed from him and just expound upon that with expletives and every other thing in any language he knows to make sure he's not too offensive. I tend to swear in a foreign language to allow me the freedom to feel that rage and to release it. My late father, Bill Ensign, used to teach me that you don't know how you feel about something until you talk it out loud. He also taught us that we need to get emotions out sometimes so that they don't get bottled up and harm our souls inside. He wasn't a highly devout Christian man, but he was a loyalist. He was very loyal to the land here. He was very loyal to the country. He's very loyal to food and the honor of being able to produce a life for his family. He was very loyal to his children and provided for them all uniquely and differently based on who they were in the world. He supported every single child in their endeavors, no matter what it was, from my eldest sister's business in Chicago to my brother's life with his longtime sweetheart in Naperville, to my siblings in this community who literally had different challenges in their lives. One with infidelity, another with drug use, another, and that wasn't them, it was people in their lives, but they got impacted by those things. Now, when I tell this story, can you recognize anyone in your life who's gone through anything like that? Perhaps you, perhaps a family member perhaps a biological family member. You see, there's two types of families I often talk about, that we have family that is our birth family, people who we were born with, they have the same mother and father or at least one parentage for us. And then we have the people that we create as our family as we go forward in life, who really love our souls, who uplift our voices, who follow us in different social media, who support our work, who want us to be successful in the goals that we have for our lives. There are strategic alliances in business practices. If we're self-employed or we're fully employed at a company, we have to have people in our company who take care of our souls. We all have people in our lives that we like and don't like. For the longest time throughout most of my life until the last couple of years, I have felt that hate was beneath me. What about you? Is hate beneath you in your life? Do you vehemently hate someone? Do you vehemently hate them so much that you would do something to foul up their life? But what about strangers? What if you learn something about a stranger from gossip? and You don't really have proof of it, and maybe you're shown proof, but what if that proof is a lie? And you make a decision that is immoral in front of God, illicit in front of your children, 
and illegal in terms of federal law to go out and harm that person's life by creating incident reports and other things to create a problem for that individual to go forward. Do you think a God looking down is going to be pleased by that? Do you think you're sowing a seed of love in the world or are you really sowing a seed of peace? You see, some people think that you produce peace through this thin blue line, that you're just on the edge of the mayhem in order to get to the truth. You see, that's not godly either. God is pretty clear in most of the religious texts around the globe that our number one role is to love him first, to honor people that come into our life paths, and to produce peace across the world. Now, how do you do that if you're vehemently attacking someone's life or participating, even in the smallest of way, like some teenagers I ran into the other day? who thought they would just keep me talking long enough to produce a problem. Then they all walked away from their duties, literally leaving me sitting there with all kinds of stuff. And I, of course, didn't move a muscle because I was tired. I was drinking a beverage I had just purchased there. But openly, it's the playing of the game in people's lives that people aren't paying attention to. There are people who are audiophiles, and they literally know how to manipulate the mind. One such person got his entire shop deleted from the Noblesville community. You know how to make subliminal audio files and CDs to supposedly help with all sorts of stuff. But I remember listening to one and feeling absolutely ill in my soul after I listened to it. So how am I supposed to know whether or not it's got the right information in it or the wrong information in it? You see, that's the problem with the inaudible world, that we don't literally know what's being played against us by the people who know how to play that game. In life, we have moments of time to make a difference for people when we are fully functioning as ourselves. Now, when I say that, what I mean is that no one is trying to psychologically abuse us with gaslighting or mobbing or other things to take away our rights. The people who go in ahead of someone to a place and say, you don't want to serve him, you don't want to help him, you don't want to do things, and then they get other people to participate in that are a part of that Stalingrad mentality of Nazism that they have rights to determine who they're going to allow in their community, and they have rights to decide who they're not going to allow. That's really not a moral practice. It's actually an immoral thing that people think, and it actually, frankly, is sort of stemming on illegal in terms of hate crimes. You see, when a person goes through a hate crime, many people don't believe and don't buy that that person's going through it. We've seen lots of films about the attacks on people's lives. J-Lo produced a really great film about a woman who is being abused by an ex-lover. It's a great film. I encourage you to watch it. There are other films about the land and the protection of it. The late Patrick Swayze and a bunch of people and teens who were popular in that time period of the 80s produced a film called Red Dawn, where literally it was imposed that the Russians had somehow slipped in through the Canadian border and were trying to take over the land. Some kids lost their life in that, but they were fighting for the rights of all human beings. Now, there's other films like Taps that sort of produce the monstrous effects of military academies and hazings and how people just get too overly involved in war. Tom Cruise was in that one. I didn't watch the whole thing, but I saw enough scenes to be made physically ill. You see, when we're trying to produce peace in the land, we produce loving film. We don't monsterize people by allowing hate or violent, or illegal and illicit, immoral content, scary films to be in the land. Now, why do I feel this? Because those things create a love of those things. So when we talk about there should be no limits, that's not necessarily true. But when we talk about that we should not limit hate things, that is immoral, in my opinion. But I'm a columnist. I'm a freelance journalist. I'm a trained individual from a reputable university, unless someone lied and stole my documents or ruined my opportunities by just saying, you know what, we're just going to delete this file like they never existed. Now think about that. We've all seen the film with Vanessa Williams and um, Arnold Schwarzenegger. I think it was called The Eraser. How they help people who are in the witness protection program is they basically erase their lives. The problem with erasing a life is that that person doesn't always know how to move forward because much of who they were is in their soul. 
yes, skill sets can be put into other positions and putting them in retail, but that's an abomination to the Lord, in my opinion, because God creates the soul. God creates the soul and their desires of what they should do in their life and how they should perform, what they should write, what they should script, what music they should compose, what rap they should write, whatever it might be that uplifts the human soul in a way that makes sense culturally, artistically, is something God loves. It's what define us, our love of games, our love of chess, our love of Dungeons and Dragons, perhaps. But even those games have a point where there has to be a fine line between what is real and what is just the pretend for entertainment value. Checkers is a pretty harmless game, but it's really about overcoming, taking away, stealing, if you will, outwitting. But in the minds of some strategists, like in the film The Kingsman, they can use audiophiles to violate people's bodies, violate their minds. That was what that was talking about. In the television show, The Person of Interest, we see how some little faction group that we don't exactly know, unless we've been with it from the beginning, who they are, why they have the power, why they can use the technology to do what they do, but they're trying to use it for good. But what if that technology was used to harm someone? To say, you know, you're not worth a life here on this planet. We're just going to try and find somebody who looks like you and we're just going to put them into your life. How would a mother feel about that? I know how my father would feel about that. He'd be outraged. But openly, when we're not thinking about how technology is utilized, even in public places like libraries, how they've got vents here that can be pumped with things, or how they've got audio channels where they can mess with people, or how they can use your computer in itself. We all know that the federal government can take a hold of your computer and look through your camera. Only a few monitors today have a switch, like I learned at one of the libraries, I think it was in Fishers, perhaps. Maybe it was here in Noblesville, where you actually can turn a switch to shut off the camera on those screens. And I thought, what a wonderful thing, the right to privacy. My laptop doesn't allow that, but I use it to create videos and audio files. While I'm not able to pay for my audio channel, where I was doing podcast interviews with live, real people who are in the world of authorship, who have international bestsellers, because people like them. They know them. They trust what they say. It might be all the same regurgitated crap like some of my favorite authors do. I've read just about every John Maxwell book is not exactly true, but most of them. And he doesn't definitely repeats things he said before because that's his shtick. When I teach Japanese, I literally teach the same lessons. To get the same productivity, I simply align myself a little differently with the soul that's in front of me. If it's a child, I produce a lot of silliness and giggling and fun. If it's an adult, I produce efficiency and performance and expectation. Now, when I talk like this, doesn't this make sense? That who we are with is who we, how we change what we do. There are families who have many children. My mother and father always made a practice of making sure every child had the same number of gifts under the tree until we really got to an age of full adult on adulthood where they just said, you know, the same amount of money was used. And by that point, none of us really gave a crap. We were just excited to watch and see what got opened by the other people in the room. That was something that my brothers and sisters had to teach their children. It was something I found annoyance with when they didn't. You see, it was a celebration of those gifts of who purchased what and the thought process they went through in thinking about that individual of what was right for them. But here's the problem sometimes, and I'm a result of that myself, that a couple of Christmases I got stuff that I didn't want at all. Ugly, horrible sweaters, things I would never wear in my life, and my job as a productive and happy child and thankful, grateful child was to simply say thank you so much, and then they went in the closet never to be worn. You see, when someone doesn't think about the soul of an individual, they do things like that. I have family members I've shared with you regularly that have done things like that. They just thought they had more rights in my life than me at almost 50. The other day, I was very careful to try and ask a young man who helped to produce some information for me that impacted my life greatly in a legal situation to confirm that a place was absolutely closed so I wouldn't miss an appointment. I had to ask him because of his social ineptitude from my humble perspective of being in business world for a long time, whether he had a guardian or not. 
I wasn't meaning to be rude. I just wanted to make sure that I had the final authority if, God forbid, I just got lied to through technology or by him intentionally. That if I had to, I could per se, look, these people told me this was closed. I had a sibling do the same, but interestingly enough, that Google text is missing from my account. I then called other state agencies to find out for sure. They all told me, the people on the phone told me that agency was closed because of weather. And it was on the television postings one night, but it wasn't the next day, which was what created some panic for me. Now, in your life, do you have moments of misunderstanding? Do you have moments of rage? Do you have moments of prosperity and propensity? Do you have moments of ponderance? Do you have moments of changing your mind on subjects? Do you have moments of making and rendering judgments on other people only to discover that you were completely wrong because you had all the wrong information? That happens a lot in politics for sure, but nobody ever exactly articulates it like that. The only other problem we have is that they don't say, you know, this is the information that I utilize to come to my own decisions on this. And that's where there's a lot of failings because you are representing people in the land. Every single human life has a right to life according to the right to life practice that is highly religious that not everyone believes in when it comes to a fetus, but they should believe it in when it comes to a full on adult. You see, there's lots of ways we can rationalize different things in this world, but in the end, we have to ask ourselves, forgive the itch, in the end, we have to ask ourselves whether or not we are policing a human being's life to harm them or are we policing a human life to protect them because our life is equally as important as their life? There are certainly some social constructs that says, if we get rid of some of these people, we bring attention to the cause. There are definitely people in different communities that want people out or in or out loud talking about things that they should do, but in reality, they can't force that person to do it. There are physicians who lie to ruin a person's rights to their bodies. My body is being ravaged now by some of the illnesses I had more than 20 years ago because someone thought they'd modify my prescription without my consent. And a pharmacist possibly lied and filled it that way, all leaving the labels as if it was the same thing. But I can tell the difference physically. Maybe it's because I've gone to a lesser dosage based on some physician's lack of understanding of what I needed. But openly, when I'm talking about these things, I'm talking about your things too. That every person really will grow old. Their cells will degenerate. And what they do right now in terms of food intake and beverage intake and sleep time and cellular health care, like with prescription things or vitamins, whatever it might be to cure what ails them or to keep them energized or whatnot, whatever there still is, has an impact. We know that Mountain Dew has some of the most strongest level caffeine, and I used to love that in college. I still love it today, but I can't handle carbonate. I've learned that. There are certain foods that I can handle on one day, and other days I can't handle them at all. I've learned to determine what those things are and how to do that. And as a result of utilizing my faith in God telling me what I should and shouldn't eat for the last five years, not only have I not had one bad meal in being out and about unless someone tainted the food, which I've had happen to me as a homeless person because kids just think it's a fun old time or someone told them to do it, which was illegal and immoral and illicit. But I've also been able to lose 14 to 16 inches off my waist. Now think about that as a, an appealing thing. I've also had some amazing experiencing being led to places I would have never found on my own. And it certainly has helped me in emergency situations that God knows precisely when I'm about, I'm about to need to take a crap and need a toilet and I'm on the road in the middle of the countryside, not knowing where to go. I've got some amazing magical stories that I'm gonna be telling in the days going forward, but I want you to understand my philosophy of the world. Because if you're gonna support me by just bothering to look at the Life Manage product called ProTandem NRF2, which I fully support, I'm still a little dirty out on NRF1 because I'm a little worried about what happens if we take the mind back to a 20 year old. It might mean that we're not making as wise of decisions, but that's just a humble opinion. I'm not disparaging it at all. I'm just giving you my reservation. But NRF2 has proven itself time and time again for a lot of people. It's helped a lot of things individually. It doesn't have a, that will automatically do this or automatically do that. No, because it interacts with you personally, your cells on the individual level. 
All we know that we can prove is that it reduces oxidative stress by 40% in 30 days. At least that was the last scientific study by railroad physicians at major universities, wherever the heck they did these things, when their uh, scientific studies, their peer reviews as they're called. And that's why I promote the product, because it's been proven by smarter minds than me in science. But I've allowed them the dignity of their industry and their experience to prove that to me. I haven't just taken on and taken on somebody's little casual opinion based on their opinion on how things work. When I did my program to determine what I needed for my own cellular health long ago, I went to the experts in the field. What is sad today is there's very few of those experts and particularly very few ones in Indiana. So we're losing some ground in some regards of some aspects of healthcare. We also recognize that things like cancer and Parkinson's haven't quite fully been discovered the answers to. So in life, if there's a way to cure yourself by listening to God, wouldn't you want to try to do it? I was led to some particular apparatuses that would help me with my situation, literally point blank from the way I pray, the way that I practice my religious faith. But some person decided to immorally, illicitly, and illegally steal those things from my home. My body's not quite the same anymore because of that fact. Now, when it comes time to talk about faith, who has the right to decide your faith in the world? Is it me? Is it your neighbor? Is it someone down the street? Is it someone across the world? Or is it you? So when I talk about all these things, and when I talk about America, especially in the time of the political campaigns going on, it is time to take back the land and the government and the rules on our roles of our life with people who are for the people of America, not just certain groups of Americans like the affluent or influent, influential, I mean, but really the people who are of all walks of life, all talks and communication styles, all beliefs, as long as they are about God loving people, all people, and frankly, we remove hate from the world. That's what I think. Now, right now, I'm sort of enjoying this fuzzy furry look that I look like, and I had one photo of me in my car when I still had my car that I just had to keep giggling over because I thought I look like a Muppet. And that was just my impression. So I called it the Muppet movie or the Muppet photo or something, and I posted it. You see, we have to take moments of time to laugh at ourselves, but there's also moments of time to help people. And I know for a fact that there were some people helping me through some of my problems of figuring out how to be homeless in a vehicle. It's much harder in winter to be homeless without a car. It's much harder because of how people respond to homelessness. They either respond with rage or indignation. I think the rage is because of their own fear of, God, if I lose this job, where am I, how am I going to pay my own bills? But I don't think they've actually intellectually processed it to that point. I think there's just that Maslow's hierarchy of needs that recognize the concern that I'm not in the best position in life to say a word about this because I could be there in two to three months time myself if I really lost my job. It's probably why I'm so passionate about helping companies in a secret shopper mode, whether I'm paid to do it or not. That when I have a really good experience, I want that employee to be praised by their boss and get the accolades they, accolades they deserve because their life will be uplifted in a soulful way, but it also might help them raise higher in their career, in their employment, in their industry. It also might allow them to have the recognition that their soul or heart or mind might need. When I have horrid experience with immature people who've been left in management, I always question a couple things. My question is really straightforward in terms of, is this person being kept because they make the numbers the company means? Meaning they keep the place running efficiently, they cut costs, they have improved some sort of performance or productivity point. But the experience that they give that's sort of duplicitous, meaning they literally are kind to some people and not kind to others, doesn't matter to the company then. But what if you could produce all of that without offending anyone ever. Wouldn't that be a blissful place to work? The other reason I'm passionate about it is because sometimes there's inefficiencies that cause ergonomic conditions, is what we're talking about, and those cause physical ailments to the employees, 
as we already know from the scientific study of that and the production of that industry in the last, let's say, 20 years that it came about, maybe slightly before that, but when it really became kind of a part of our culture to pay attention to, that when a person is walking back and forth and walking back and forth and not really having a good productive line, not only is it impacting performance and cost effectiveness of that hourly employee or salary person, but it's also impacting their health, which means the company may end up having more insurance claims for fatigue, for backache, for leg problems, for knee issues, for surgeries, for other things that are more costly. I said that to a manager on a morning shift. I observed, they've got you walking all over the place for this. And she just smirked as if I was being silly in saying so. And I was expressing a concern for her health long term, but also for the company's dollar. But see, a mind like that isn't always understood by hourly employees who really are just there to make their money and go home. I've talked to a handful of retail employees who literally have stayed in their positions for 17 some years. Clearly that position fits their lifestyle, fits their mentality, fits their social structures, fits their needs. But for others, it may not. Now in life, we have moments of time to really help someone. How do you help someone that you think in your mind, maybe I should help that person? That's the small voice of the Lord saying, could you help that person? Then you have to strategize, do I have time to help them? But you also have to look at, how do I approach that individual who might be a total stranger to me, or might be just a casual acquaintance, or might even be someone I really care about, and ask them how you can help them? Now, this has been Blake Ensign of Blaze Communications, LLC, saying thank you for listening to these sort of on-the-fly journalistics audio files that have both political merit and spiritual merit and perhaps psycho-emotional merit. Thanks for listening.